That's are we going to be mean, Hannah, or are we yes. going to be nice? Be... Or who's going to be the mean guy and who's going to be the nice one? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I think Ahmed is not capable of being mean, so. Dude, I was really <laughs> mean to you last time. No, you were just like... being fast. You won't be oh, okay. mean. Yeah, I don't know. All I right. guess, you know, I don't want to be mean, I guess. <laughs> is there a topic that you want to start with? Do any anything? You want to Literally anything. Okay. All right. You want to start, Ahmed, or you want me to? Yeah, sure. So let's say, uh, doctor, you have a patient who comes to your office complaining of uh, uh, vaginal itching and discharge. What is your differential diagnosis, and how would you work her up? Uh, for vaginal itching and discharge, uh, my differential will be uh, acute vaginitis uh, with uh, candida or BV or trichomonas. Um, it could also be uh, uh, sexually transmitted diseases such as chlamydia, gonorrhea. Um, I will also, uh, depending on the patient's age, I will also worry about if it's like a, a, a more bloody discharge. So I will worry about uh, a uterine uh, bleeding. Um, so depending on the patient's age, I will consider. Also, I will also consider uh, an endometrial biopsy. Um, and then uh, in terms of workup um, uh, for the for the uh, acute vaginitis, I will usually do a, um, a vaginitis uh, panel uh, looking for uh, B, uh, um, Gardnerella and uh, yeast or trichomonas. I also will screen her for STDs. Um, uh, and okay, doctor. So, uh, 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 so what is uh, Gardnerella? What is that? It's a uh, um, bacteria that usually is in the uh, vaginal flora. Um, however, sometimes with with uh, pH changes, um, it can uh, overgrow um, and cause cause uh, vaginal symptoms such as discharge and um, what? smell. Oh, 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 what change uh, like happens to the pH? Uh, the pH usually goes uh, more basic. More basic. Okay. Yes. Uh, do you have a number? Uh, it's over six. Okay. And uh, how do you treat, uh, uh, did you say uh, bacterial vaginosis? How do you uh, diagnose uh, bacterial vaginosis? Do you use like a panel uh, like every time or is there like another way you could uh, diagnose it? Uh, you could also use the AMSOS criteria. Um, so we don't have a, a microscope in our uh, clinic. So I usually uh, use patient symptoms. If patient has like uh, a, a smell, um, a fishy odor, um, and then um, also I can use a, a pH uh, strip um so for the m cells criteria you need three out of the four um so a whiff test um a crew cells on the microscope uh, you can use uh, uh, the, uh increased ph and um and then a, a grayish discharge uh, vaginal discharge so if you meet three out of the four you can diagnose patient with um uh, a bv Okay. You want to go, Hannah? Um, pH is 4.5, just so you know. Yes. That's that's the normal pH. And greater than, than 4.5 is Ansel's yeah. criteria. Oh, greater than 4.5. Got it. Um, how would you treat um, BV versus yeast? Nice. That was uh, my next question, so thank you, Hannah. <laughs> <laughs> so for BV, I would treat with metronidazole, 500 milligrams uh, BID times seven days versus if it's yeast, um, I would treat with uh, one dose of um, diflucan, 100 milligram, uh, 150 milligrams PO. Okay, and um, let's say that this patient has um, a complicated yeast infection. What, what does that consist of and how would you treat it differently? 
Um, there are a few scenarios uh, that could constitute as a complicated yeast infection. Um, so if you have recurrent yeast infections or if you have uh, ulcerations or uh, um, uh, well, basic ulcerations or erythemas caused by yeast or if the patient is uh, immunocompromised um, mm -hmm. those are some of the situations where it, it could be a count, uh, it could count as a uh, uh, complicated yeast infection. Um, to treat it, you can uh, you can do um, Diflucan, uh, uh, three three doses um, every uh, seventy two hours. Okay, see. and what's um, what's an alternative for that? Um, you could also do uh, vaginal terconazole, either the seven-day mm -hmm. course or the three-day course, or you can try uh, boric acid. Uh, I believe it's 400 milligrams. I will have to look up the exact dosing uh, if okay. I want to treat with boric acid. Yeah, to topical for seven to ten days. Topical uh, terconazole? Uh, terconazole or um, clometrazole for seven to ten days would be the alternative. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm, I think it's seven to fourteen, but uh, or like ten to fourteen even with like uh, complicated. 10 to 14. Yeah. The vaginal okay, so one. It's the vaginal one, yeah. Or yeah. or or, or, yeah, you're right. it's seven, yes. yeah, yeah. Yeah, because you're right. It's seven days if it's uncomplicated, right? And then seven, ten to fourteen. Right. If it's yeah. Right. Uh, and what, uh, but doctor, isn't there isn't there a dose that's like a higher dose that you can just do three day, three day dose? That's higher. Um, yeah, but that, I don't. That's for uncomplicated. Here. I think. Yeah, that's for simple because it's the same uh, like like uh, like you just need to deliver the same amount of medication, but like over a shorter amount of days. So uh, that's why you give like a higher dose. But if you're uh, delivering like uh, the normal amount, it can happen over five or seven days or whatever. But mm, but I think that's for uh, simple like uh, uh, like 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 uncomplicated uh, yeast, not okay. too complicated. Uh, doctor, what's uh, how do you uh, diagnose? Uh, I think you mentioned uh, recurrent BV and like recurrent yeast. How do you uh, diagnose uh, those? Like, what are your criteria? And when do you call someone uh, having recurrent yeast and recurrent BV? Yes. Uh, so um, for recurrent uh, yeast infection, it's either three uh, episodes in six months or four episodes in one year. Nice, yeah. And for BV, for BV, I believe it's uh three episodes in uh in one year. Right. Yep. And what and and like how do you diagnose uh, recurrent UTIs? How many UTIs do you need uh to diagnose one? Recurrent UTI would be uh I want to say also three. So two in six months or uh, uh, three, three in, in six in months. A year. Yeah, no, two, in uh, two or more in six months or um, or three or more in a year. That's where you Okay, guys. all right, cool. Cool. Sorry to take the mic. You can you can continue. And I, I wasn't sure if you were done or not. No, that's okay. So um, you were working your patient up for acute vaginitis and then um, that night she prevents, she presents over in the ER. Um, and she has acute pelvic pain on the right side. Uh, what is your differential diagnosis change to? So I was working her up for for what? This is the patient. You you were working her up for for acute vaginitis. She had itching. She oh, had dis and then she and went now to tonight, the ER. Okay. Now tonight she went to the ER and she has a sudden severe right sided pain. What are you now concerned about? Okay, so for someone who has acute. Um, Pelvic pain, um, my differential will be uh, GYN and then non-GYN causes. For GYN causes, uh, I will be concerned about an atopic pregnancy. 
uh, a tubal ovarian abscess, um, a ruptured uh, uh, ovarian cyst, um, uh, and um, also for uh, and then for for non GYN causes, I will be concerned about um, uh, a ruptured appendix, um, a, ru uh, a ruptured or just not ruptured, but um, uh, diverticulitis, uh, diverticulosis, um, some type of um, bowel obstruction. Um, Renal stone. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Renal, renal kidney, kidney stone. Uh, or pylo. I'm sorry. I said you could even say UTI or pylo. I mean, less likely, but mm -hmm. right, pylo. Just right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. So, um, imaging is done, and it's unremarkable. But she has cervical motion tenderness. How would you treat her? So in this case, I will uh, still be concerned for possible uh, PID, uh, even though she doesn't have maybe like a TOA, but uh, any, uh, any sexually active female with um, acute or, chron or uh, mostly acute pelvic pain, I would still want to uh, treat her for possible uh, PID. So I would treat her with uh, IM ceftriaxone, 500 milligrams, uh, one time dose with- uh, How much? 500. How much, Doctor? Oh, did you say, okay. Yeah, 500 milligram ceftriaxone, uh, IM dose. Um, and then doxycycline, 100 milligram um, uh, P-O-B-I-D times 14 days and metronidazole 500 milligrams P-O-B-I-D 14 days. So doctor, what if the patient tells you she has severe nausea and vomiting and like she can't take any medications? How would you, uh, like how would you manage that? Then this patient will need to uh, be inpatient um, and be started on IV versions of those medications. Okay, how how long would you keep her in the hospital for? I would keep her to uh, at least at least uh, forty eight hours, uh, at least twenty four hours, um, depending on how her symptoms are, um, and also see if she, uh, you know, try to figure out the reason she cannot take uh, PO medication, um, and then uh, if it's due to pain. Uh, she will have uh, pain control, um, and then when once she can uh, tolerate PO, I will switch her to PO medication for another for a total duration of um, uh, two weeks. Okay. What are other reasons that you would admit her to the hospital besides nausea vomiting? Um, other reason would be if she's pregnant, uh, if the patient. Um, is not very uh, good for uh, uh, not good for uh, follow up. Um, if the patient uh, has very high uh, temperature, um, where I, I where I'm concerned for a possible TOA or other uh, non gonococological uh, etiologies for her uh, fever. Okay. How much is how much is a really high temperature? What, what's the number? One oh one. Okay. All right. You wanna do another question? Whatever you guys want, or we can switch. I think we can switch. I can be next. Let's switch. But I, but I think for boric acid it's uh, six hundred milligrams intravaginally, QHS. Uh yep. And what else? And uh, for how, for how long? Phone? I believe for it's like, for like I think four to six weeks, or or, or like uh, possibly longer, like three to six months. I need uh, to look up the, uh, the the duration, but you can use it with uh, recurrent BV or like recurrent uh, candida. Yeah, I think for non typical Albican, it's fourteen days, and then for recurrent, I think you're right. It's like three to six months. I don't remember what the dosage is either. You mean for a caparata? 
Yeah, Galblarma, you can use it as a first-line treatment because it works as well as Azul's, which means it doesn't really work at all. Uh, I thought for... Uh, are, you, are you talking about non-Galblarma, right? Non, and then uh, Albicans, yeah, non-Albicans. No, so for it says for Gabrata, I'm I'm reading uh, up to date right now. Uh, it says for two to three weeks. Yeah, yeah, fourteen days. Uh huh. Okay. But if it's a recurrent BV, you can use it as well. And I think Ahmed's right. I think it's like six months. That one I have to always look up whenever I use it. But yeah, oh, six months. Yeah, you treat them with like either a vaginal or a oral um, flagell, mm -hmm. and then you put them on suppressive therapy for like six months of boric acid vaginally. If it's orally it's toxic. Oh wait, yeah, you so... talking about BV right now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. BV. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I was looking at um, vaginal. Oh, sorry, uh, Canada. Mister up to date over here. All right. Yeah, literally, <laughs> I, I use up to date for everything. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Apparently you can say that on the exam, by the way. That's what oh, really? my, my preceptor that I was practicing with on Friday said because we were talking about like DKA. And I was uh -huh. like, I would call MFM because I don't deal with DKA. I wouldn't know what level of fluids and stuff. And he uh -huh. said, um, he don't said, you're that. not available. What would you do? And I said, I would look it up on up to date because I don't know what the fluids are. And he said, that's a reasonable answer because you need to have some uh -huh. reason. So otherwise you're yeah. just going to throw numbers out there that don't make sense. Mm hmm. Ah, uh, okay, cool. All right, Ahmed, you want to go first next? Yeah, sure. I'm ready. Let's do uh, something uh, not on the case list, like uh, something like this, you know? Yeah, sure. Uh, let me just pick out something random. Then. Uh oh, Mister Up to Date. <laughs> no, no, it'll it'll be. I'm just gonna. I am... You want to go uh, first? Because I got. Yeah. Um, you are called to the recovery room after a laparoscopic hysterectomy. Um, there is a small amount of blood tinged urine in the Foley and mm. the nurse is concerned. What do you do? So first, uh, I, uh, review what the patient's history is. What, uh, why was she getting the hysterectomy? Was the surgery complicated? Uh, what were uh, the intraoperative, uh, findings, any, uh, complications that happened during the surgery? Like, uh, lysis of adhesions, uh, prior uh, surgery, thick uh, scar tissue, uh, things like that can uh, can uh, can uh, predispose the patient to like a bladder injury. And then I would review the patient's medications, uh, make sure she didn't get anything that would cause uh, discoloration of the urine, such as uh, 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 peridium or anything like that. I would I would also examine uh, the patient's uh, 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 the tubing of the. Uh, of the catheter to see if it's uh, draining uh, uh, darker uh, darker tinged uh, blood, like if uh, like if it looks like uh, light bleeding in the bag, but it's uh, but it's a darker red in the tubing. I would be more concerned, and I would also try to flush uh, the Foley catheter to make sure there's no like clot sitting there or. Uh, um, or something that would cause like uh, some sort of like uh, like blockage to 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 the urine being drained, um, uh, and then that would be my uh, my initial assessment, and then I could uh, uh, then I could consider uh, performing some. Uh, uh, some uh, lab uh, lab l lab evaluation to uh, to to assess the serum creatinine levels and uh, to see if the patient uh, has like a big drop in her hemoglobin from uh, from uh, prior to surgery. And I would also uh, before uh, the lab levels, I would examine the patient uh, to see if she has any significant uh, tenderness over. Uh, the suprapubic area, uh, 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 or uh, or or anywhere on her abdomen, or her uh, or her costal uh, vertebral angles, uh, and I may consider uh, performing some imaging as well. Okay, before you do imaging and labs, when you're doing your abdominal exam, what else do you want to assess? Uh, rebound tenderness, guarding. Uh, uh, I would assess. 
Sorry, say that again. You forgot vitals. Oh, vitals. Yeah, of course. Um, okay, so uh, abdominal exam is normal. Vitals are stable. Uh, you give the patient an IV fluid bolus, and there is um, still low urine output. What um, What is your differential diagnosis at this point? Uh, so my differential would be either uh, hypovolemia related to the surgery, and the patient may need some more uh, hydration. That's something that I can... Uh, determine uh, based on uh, the lab evaluation as well. Uh, it would also include uh, a urinary tract injury, uh, so either a bladder injury or uh, or or a ur or a ureteric injury or both, uh, or maybe the patient uh, uh, or maybe the patient is having uh, a renal failure or. Uh, failure uh, of the kidney to function at this point, acute renal failure, for example. Okay, and um, what's the other one that's really easy to fix? Uh, replace the Foley? Yeah, a King, a King Foley, like you said, with the flushing. Right. Um, what imaging study would you want to order, or how would you do your imaging study if you were concerned about the, the uh, ureters? So the so the ureters, I would perform a CT uh, a CT scan with uh, IV uh, contrast uh, to evaluate uh, the renal system. So it would be a, a CT uh, a urogram, and I would also examine, uh, and that would be with 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 like IV uh, contrast, and I would also examine uh, the the late films. Uh, alternatively. Uh, 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 a very uh, li like an 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 imaging an imaging method an imaging method that it, that has a very high uh, sensitivity in uh, picking uh, up uh, urinary tract injury would be uh, a cystoscopy with an intravenous uh, pyelogram, but the patient needs to go back to the operating room for that. And would you perform that? No, I do not perform those in my practice. So what would you need to do if you wanted to perform that? I would uh, um, I would consult my uh, urology colleagues. Okay, cool. All right, that's my question. All right. Something completely different. OB, uh, I know Mr. Up-to-Date has some <laughs> OB for me. All right, go ahead. Dude. All right. So doctor, can you tell me a little bit about autonomic dysreflexia? Uh, I, uh, I believe, uh, it's, uh, an inherited, uh, disorder, uh, uh, the other name for it is, uh, POTS syndrome, uh, no, 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 autonomic dysreflexia, not dysautonomia, no, dysreflexia, uh, autonomic dysreflexia, I believe that, uh, can result secondary to, uh, a spinal cord injury, where there is uh, a neurogenic bladder sort of uh, presentation, uh, and there is a disruption, and uh, the uh, there is uh, there is there is a disruption between uh, uh, the connections between the cerebral uh, cortex, uh, the brainstem centers, and the spinal uh, cord. Uh, to uh, coordinate uh, the function uh, of the bladder in terms of filling and uh, and uh, storage as well as emptying. Uh, and uh, some of the common reasons uh, for that are either a neurological disease or uh, or uh, or uh, systemic diseases that can cause a neurological uh, a, a deficit, uh, such as uh, diabetes, uh, multiple uh, sclerosis or uh, Parkinson's or uh, uh, or uh, uh, following an, uh, a traumatic injury to the spinal cord. Okay. Um, what are some of the symptoms? Or let's say this patient is uh, pregnant. What, what would uh, the patient, uh, what are some of the symptoms the patient will, will have? Or... So I believe the symptoms uh, depend on uh, on the level of injury, uh, uh, if the injury uh, of like in the spinal cord or uh, the neuro the neurological 
deficit happens uh, supra-sacrally, uh, then uh, uh, the, uh, the symptoms can include uh, 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 inability uh, to store your, uh, or sorry, not that. Uh, the symptoms could either include uh, a clinical picture that would uh, show uh, this synergesia between the detrusor activity and uh, the sphincter, uh, uh, the external uh, urinary sphincter. Uh, or uh, spasm of the of the trucer, uh, the trucer hyperactivity. I I believe uh, both these pictures are common if uh, if the injury uh, happens uh, uh, suprasacrally, but if the injury happens at the at the level of the sacrum, uh, the clinical picture or the deficit is usually more of a. a uh, the trues are like uh, it's usually like a flaccid uh, bladder where uh, ooh, ooh, where the bladder uh, fills up and then there's uh, there is there is overflow incontinence. Okay, so I don't think you, I don't think we're talking about the same thing. I'm so, not sure if we're answering the same thing either. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know. So autonomic dis uh, reflexia is basically when the patient has a T6 or above lesion where the parasympathetic uh, nerves are sending signals to the brain to uh, basically dilate the blood vessels. However, the sympathetic nerves cannot travel down to the rest of the body to actually help you know, dilate the blood vessels. So the patient has, um, like you know, flushing. Oh, like syndrome, right? Yeah. I don't know if that's the name. Do Do you know Hannah? That's a another name for it. I didn't hear what name he said. Pots. Pots syndrome. Yeah. I, I, Pot? It's. it's mm, um, I think so. He, yeah, I think that's what it's called. Let me look it up. Hold okay. on. Let me go back because I'm walking around uh, while I'm talking to you guys, so I have to go back to the computer. Okay. Yeah. So basically, um, there's a dysregulation of sympathetic, sympathetic and parasympathetic system, um, and then it can be exaggerated by uh, the bladder overfill bladder, um, and also Pots labor. Pots disease. Um, Pots oh, isn't no. when there is a uh, like a uh, spinal cord injury though pots is like postural uh, orthostatic hypotension it's like when they yeah stand up or they um right they have an, an abnormal reflux where their um their tachycardia like persists and their blood pressure drops and it doesn't um uh right. their body doesn't or, like yeah, um, exactly. adapt to the yeah. change in, in posture no that's different because this mm. one you have no, where did um, you get this from dude this one you have uh, bradycardia, not not um. So there's a committee opinion eight o eight o b with spinal cord injuries. Oh wow! Yeah, um, they talk about autonomic dysreflexia. Uh, so mm -hmm. basically, you're trying to eliminate the noxious stimuli such as bladder distension, bowel impaction. Um, and then during labor, you're trying to lim uh, try to limit uh, cervical exams and fundal massages. Um, and you basically, cause, cause they can get the, um, the, the bradycardia hypertension. Um, yeah. Cause the, cause the, what do you call it? The, uh, the reflex is absent. Uh, the one that, like Hannah was talking about, like, uh, uh, like uh, the compensatory. Uh, yeah, the compensatory uh, mechanism is, does yeah, not go down exactly. to the lower extremities, um, past the the, the T six positions. Wow. So, um, but apparently they can still have a vaginal delivery. Uh, yeah, because because uh, labor like uh, someone who has like uh, 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 like hemiplegia, they can still uh, deliver vaginally, you know, because uh, the uterus just contracts, and you know, 
Yeah. It's like uh, the mechanism of labor is uh, more like uh, in uh, voluntary, like, uh, like they can't push, but, uh, or like they can push if you tell them, but they won't feel much, you know? Right. So, so even though they don't feel pain, you still supposed to give them um, an epidural because that helps with mm -hmm. the, the hypertension. Yeah. The hypertension mm -hmm. that caused, uh, that's caused by the lower, um, lower body. Um, and then you can also use uh, nitroglycerin for the hypertension. Um, and then, cool. yeah, okay. I mean, you can- Wow, you must, um, you must have studied like everything that now you're looking at this disease. Like I've never heard of it before. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I yeah. went through all the community opinions. Nice, um, dude. Yeah. All right, Hannah, you wanna go next? Anna? Sorry, I had you on mute. Yeah, that's fine. I'll go next. <laughs> uh, you want to go first? All right. Yeah, sure. All right, doctor. Let's say you have a 48-year-old G3, G4, P4. I think she wants, comes... a, I think she wants a GYN question. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. If you have GYN, I just did my OB practice with my um, one of my old attendings on Friday. So I feel better How about that. Go? How did it go? Uh, it went okay. I know nothing about DKA. I did okay for like uh, <laughs> PROM. I did okay for like preterm labor. He did one on DKA and he did one on um, postpartum hemorrhage. Um, yeah, those are popular uh, ones. And like yeah. the thyroid storm, uh, I, like I feel that's something they may ask to. But yeah, let's do yeah. GYN. Yeah. Okay. So let's say you have a G, uh, like a 48 year old G4 P4 uh, coming to you complaining of two years of pain from the pelvis how would you evaluate her and like what are some of the common causes that can uh, stop sorry about that okay so um first thing i would do is take a history and a and do a physical exam with like a detailed pelvic exam um i would um want to know if it's um uh constant or cyclical uh alleviating and um worsening factors, um, how she describes it. Um, I'd want to know about her periods, uh, her bladder and bowel habits. Um, on my physical exam, I would want to, um, to palpate the muscles, the ligaments, as well as the, the uterus, cervix, and ovaries. Um, what, are what, was looking for? Uh, what are you looking for when you uh, palpate the ligaments and uh, the uterus, cervix, and ovaries? Well, my differential would would include GYN and non-GYN causes. So some of the mm -hmm. non-GYN things I'd be worried about would be um, like uh, myo, uh, uh, myofascial pain. Um, I would be concerned for levator spasm. Um, for a GYN concern, uh, while I'm palpating the muscles and ligaments, I'd be concerned about um, endometriosis implants. Um, so I, I'd want to feel for like thickening of the uterosacrals, um, if there's any nodularity. Okay. Um, and, how, and how would you uh, uh, how would you work her up? Like, uh, let's say the exam is completely benign, and she still has pain. Um, so I would do a couple things simultaneously. First thing I would do is order her a pelvic ultrasound, and I would also have her keep a journal between now and the next time I see her as to when she gets the pain, what she's doing when it happens, where it is in relation to her periods, um, her bowel and bladder movements. Kind of have her keep a diary. Um, I would do a um, vaginitis swab, an STD swab, to rule out any sort of infection that could be causing the pain. I would order a urine culture. Um, and um, I would kind of start there for my workup. Would you do a STI oh. panel? She said she would, yeah. Oh, okay. um, Yeah. She I said, said STD oh. swab. Okay. Oh, okay, and let's say and let's say uh, her urine culture comes back normal, and she uh, and from uh, keeping her diary, she tells you that she has the pain every time, right before she pees, and whenever she pees, it feels a little bit better. But she feels that she's not peeing completely every time. What would your uh, differential be at this time? So I would be concerned um, that it could be. Um, uh, interstitial cystitis. Um, I would also be concerned that it could still be endometriosis. 
Um, I'd also be concerned that it could be a large fibroid that's pushing on the bladder. And or an enlarged. And, Go ahead. Uh, what, uh, what's, uh, what's the other name that, uh, that we use now for interstitial cystitis? Oh, I don't remember. Okay. And how would you treat her? Let's say it's that disease. How would you manage her? Um, so I would do, uh, I would talk to her about, um, uh, timing her voids and foods that can, um, worsen her symptoms. I would, um, start her on, um, amtriptyline and then I would, um, refer her over to urology for, um, both of uh, pelvic floor physical therapy and then also further management. Well, first of all, how do you, how do you diagnose uh, painful bladder syndrome? Oh, that's what it's called, pain for, pa painful bladder syndrome. Mm -hmm. how, do you uh, yes. how do you diagnose it? It's a, it's a diagnosis um, by ruling out other causes of pain. Diagnosis of exclusion. There are things that you can see on cystoscopy, which is one of the reasons I would want to refer her over to urology. I don't do cystoscopy in my office. Um, uh, like you can have, um, the, hum yeah, um, mm -hmm. inside the bladder. And, um, uh, so those are things that I would want them to assist me in working her up to see if this is the appropriate diagnosis. So if, uh, you said it's a diagnosis of exclusion. So <laughs> anybody who has pain and you rule out everything else, so she has, so she, then she will have painful bladder syndrome. Well, if her symptoms are all um, urinary, her urine culture is negative, there's no signs that she has endometriosis, her uterus is completely normal on ultrasound, then that would be my leading diagnosis at that point. So I would want to try her on amtriptyline to see if it helps, and then I would want to refer her over to urology to see, first off, if I'm missing anything um, that could be causing the uh, cystitis, um, but then also for uh, further management, because if the amtriptyline is helping, and this truly is... Um, uh, painful bladder syn um, syndrome, uh, then there's other um, treatments that they can do besides the amtriptyline to help her. Like what, doctor? Um, Let's say your uh, your uh, your uh, urologist is away for six months on like a sabbatical. How would you like? And uh, the amtriptyline doesn't work. Uh, uh, what are some of the patient's uh, like options besides amtriptyline? So there's also, like I said, pelvic floor physical therapy. There is um, a lifestyle modification. Uh, she would need to be, um, she could be tried on antihistamines. Um, you can also do bladder hydrodistension and you can do um, uh, Botox injections, botulinum toxin injections um, nice. to see yeah. if that can help um, prevent bladder spasms. Okay. Have you heard of... Uh uh, pantosan uh, polysulfate, doctor? No, what is that? El Elmeron. <laughs> oh, Elmeron. Yes, I have heard of Elmeron. Okay. Uh, did okay. you uh, prescribe it before? No. Okay. How would we'll you talk about you it? Said, you say you're going to prescribe amitriptyline. How do you prescribe that? So, uh, amitriptyline is used uh, 10 milligrams at bedtime. And then you can increase it. I believe it's up to a dose of 50. And so you go up weekly um, to a maximum dose uh, until they have relief. Okay. Um, what, uh, what are the uh, non-GON causes of uh, chronic pelvic pain? Uh, so non Non GYN causes um, can be things like the painful bladder syndrome, um, UTI, uh, renal, or um, not renal, sorry, um, bladder stones, um, cancer, whether or not it's bladder, intestinal, colon. Um, you can have diverticulitis, diverticulosis, um, uh, chronic constipation, um, uh, muscle skeletal. Um, there's also a psychologic component. So, um, uh, severe anxiety, depression can present with um, with referred pain. Uh, there can be uh, neurologic um, diagnoses such as um, uh, oh my god, I can't think of the name right now. 
What's the name of the pain where you have it all over your body? I can't think of the name of it right now. I want to say myasthenia gravis. Fibromyalgia. Yeah. I was going to say myasthenia gravis, and I'm like, no, that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> um, like fibromyalgia, um, uh, history of trauma um, can uh, can worsen pelvic pain. Um, yeah. Have you heard of uh, irritable bowel syndrome before? Yeah. Okay. So irritable bowel, also inflammatory bowel, uh, bowel disease can cause it. What are what are the patient's symptoms that will make you think it's an irritable bowel syndrome? So um, irritable bowel syndrome, um, they um, alternate between um, typically uh, constipation and diarrhea. Um, they have um, recurrent abdominal pain um, that is um, uh, relieved by having um, a defecation. Um, they um, have usually it's the same thing as as painful bladder. It's a um, diagnosis of exclusion, so you rule out um, uh, uh, physical causes first, like diverticulitis, diverticulosis. Um, and then, um, yeah. Okay. Are you aware if there's any criteria that, um, that people use? Um, I know there's the Rome criteria, but I would have to look it up. Um, I know it's related to how often they have, um, pelvic pain. And I know it has to be related to, um, like changes in stool consistency and it's improved with defecation, but I don't know the, the entire criteria. Okay. Um, what, what are some of the um, criteria you use to, to evaluate a, um, an nexo mass? Um, so for a adenexal mass, um, I usually use the IOTA criteria. Um, so it's related to um, whether or not it's unilateral or bilateral, um, the size of the mass, um, and then ultrasound characteristics if there's um, uh, nodules, um, papillary projections, solid and cystic components, um, whether or not there is internal blood flow, um, to determine whether or not I consider it to be, um, first off, simple versus complex, and then if it's complex, whether or not it could potentially be malignant. Is there any lab values that you order? Yes, I order um, ovarian tumor markers. So if it's in the younger population, this would be things like AFP, LDH, um, the um, pregnancy hormone, um, HCG, and then um, CA125. In an older population, um, I use CA125, CEA, um, CA199 to see if this could be a colon cancer primary, um, inhibin, and um, there's one more. Those are the main human, four. Human epididymal antigen 4, HE4. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So... Um... How would you evaluate these? Um, let's say you're suspicious for a cancer. What are some of the um, criteria? What are some of the the the, the things that you would uh, make you send this patient to the oncologist? So the first one would be the Roma score, um, which is calculated based on if they're pre or postmenopausal. Um, their CA one twenty five level. Um, the human epidemic is four. And so it gives you a value as to whether or not this could be malignancy. Um, but then I would also use the other labs. Um, so like if their CEA, CA199 are both elevated, I would be concerned this is a colon and I'd want to send them for a GI referral. Um, so they can at least get a colonoscopy, um, you know, before sending them over to Gynonc. I would um, also look at the ultrasound to see if there's anything concerning that could be malignant in terms, like I said, cystic or solid components, um, papillary projections, 
um, whether or not there's internal blood flow, if this is a unilateral versus bilateral, how big it is. Um, and then uh, if I was concerned on ultrasound, I would also order um, a CT chest, abdomen, pelvis, because if there's things like uh, carcinomatosis, I would be significantly more concerned that this is a malignancy um, than if everything is normal and their, um, their ultrasound looks more like it could be a hemorrhagic cyst. Okay. That's all my questions. <laughs> That's, that's that's good. Good. Okay. All right, Ray, your turn again. Oh, you want to go over some of the questions? You want to go over it? You want, we're, it's only 2 o'clock. Do you guys want to do another round? Yeah, we can do that. We can do it to 3 yeah. if you want. Yeah. I was hoping, I, 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 was hoping because I think I, uh, I was going to get called on in the webinar today. Uh, they sent me an email. So I was hoping to like review some things and stuff. Uh, but yeah, I can stay for a little bit more if you guys want. We can just do like another like half an hour, just do one question each and then we can, we can split. I got some work I need to do too. I'm working on a PowerPoint for training this week. So. Okay. Sure. Uh -huh. All right. Sounds good. All right. Sure. So, uh, uh, so, uh, pentosan and polysulfate, uh, oh, 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 what's, mm, what's the other name for it you guys used? Uh, Elmeron or something? Elmeron. Elmeron. Yeah. Elmeron. Elmeron. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so there, so there was like, and like FDA uh, warning in, uh, in like 2020 about it causing uh, macular degeneration. So, uh, so like before you prescribe it, you need to have like a baseline retinal exam and like you need to follow this patient Q6 months with that uh, to make sure there's no uh, damage. So that's the thing about it. So kind of uh, like tamoxifen. Tamoxifen. I was looking at after we had that in-person course, you know, because they're like, oh, everyone needs to basically be on tamoxifen that has a high lifetime risk or high five-year risk or whatever it is. Uh -huh. Fi high five-year risk, but we do lifetime in my office. And I was looking at all the side effects to see if it's something that we want to prescribe because there's no breast surgeons out here. And it causes, like, um, like retinitis. It increases your chance oh. of cataracts. It increases your chance of acute glaucoma. <laughs> it's oh, like wow. a 20% chance of getting some sort of eye complication with tamoxifen like long-term use i was like maybe i don't want to prescribe this uh -huh. yeah wow that's yeah i didn't know that <laughs> i only thought it caused like uh low bone mineral density that's like the main thing uh no i i actually wrote it down because i was thinking about um prescribing it so i was like looking up all the side effects let me see if i can find them just so you know because in case they ask it so 20 to 30 percent will have hot flashes Mm -hmm. Um, twenty five percent have an increased risk of abnormal bleeding due to polyps or malignancy. Um, ten percent have an increased risk of cataracts, vision changes uh, from acute uh, from acute changes such as acute glaucoma, um, retinitis, um, or uh, optic nerve neuritis. Um, ten percent have an increased risk of uh, arthritis, and then there's a five percent chance of getting um, a blood clot mm -hmm. if they have other risk factors. And there's a 5% chance of getting um, pancytopenia. <laughs> so basically, don't prescribe it. <laughs> so I was like, this is not something that I want to prescribe in my office. <laughs> what about uh, low bone mineral density? That's one of the things that causes too, right? Yeah, I don't have that on here in terms of the percentages. I was just looking right, at things right. like I didn't know. Um, Wait, and I, then thought, it was I thought it helps with bones. No, that's uh, roloxifen. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah, not tamoxifen. Yeah. yeah, and then for tamoxifen, it's 20 milligrams daily for five years. Um, you need a baseline um, uh, eye exam, lipids, CMP, CBC, and then you're supposed to repeat it yearly. No, hmm. I'm not going to do that. Yeah. yeah, I don't prescribe that. I don't do that. So, oh, anyway, yeah. All, right. All right, anyway. Go ahead. All right. Um, staying on the GYN, um, you have a person that underwent a laparotomy for a C-section. Um, they present to your office two days later with a serosanguineous discharge. What is your differential diagnosis? Uh, I would think about um, like a seroma, um, some type of uh, uh, cellulitis or a, a superficial abscess or a, uh, a deeper abscess, uh, uh, 
either a wound um it could also be a, like a fascial uh separation or a, a dehiscence or, or a partial wound uh separation um what's the other thing seroma and what goes along with the seroma a hematoma yeah hematoma yeah uh I, that would be all my what is your um what are risk factors for this patient that would increase their chance of having a uh, significant complication compared to a superficial infection uh if they had uh a diabetes or if they're obese um if they have chronic hypertension if they had increased um, blood loss during uh, the procedure or longer um, procedure mm -hmm. um, if they didn't what? clean their uh, wound well uh -huh. uh, what kind of goes along with that oh if they had like a if they had like a, a, a recent bv or like a remote infection uh, not, that's all I can think of. Uh, if they had antibiotics during um, during their surgery, um, and then also type of wound closure. Uh, what, what about obesity? I, I said obesity. Oh, you did. Hey, right, what, what wound closure? You said type of wound closure. So, like staples versus suture versus like PDF versus uh, like if you did like a you know PDS fascial closure versus like if you use like a like a cat gut or Oh, oh, okay, okay. So the type, the type of wound closure. Got it. Okay. This uh, this says um, both the type of uh, closure for the skin as well as for the fascia, uh, and can change your your chance of infection. Okay. Um, about... Oh, you're not done. Go ahead. No, no, I'm done. Uh, okay, doctor. So, like, uh, so, like, you did mention diabetes. So, let's say this patient shows up on the same day in your office with the serosanguineous discharge, and then uh, uh, you take like a random uh, blood sugar because she's a diabetic, and it's two hundred and fifty. <laughs> how how would you? Uh, uh, what would you be concerned about, and how would you manage it? I I will I will uh, refer this patient to Doctor Hannah, as she's <laughs> very good at. Uh, DKA management. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all I know is she needs IV plenty of IV fluids, and she needs to be on insulin with um, a potassium. <laughs> I have to look up the. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's 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 on like the practice bulletin of uh, uh, pre gestational diabetes. There's like yeah. a nice table there I need from to, APOC, I need but, to go over. It. But there's like some points that yeah. So uh, the potassium, uh, like it depends on what your starting level is. Like if it's low, you shouldn't give her insulin because if you give her insulin, that's going to cause more like hypokalemia. So you should right. like hold it. And, and and like low is less than 3.3 .3 for the potassium. And then if it's between 3.3 .3 and 5.3, then you should replace it at uh, 20 to 30 uh, milli equivalent in, in, like, in like each liter of, uh, of, of, le of, of like fluid you give it. And if it's more than uh, 5.3, then, like, uh, then like you don't give calcium, but uh, you just check it every hour. Uh, to see when you need to replace it. And calcium. for the fluids, you start... Wait, you hmm? said calcium? Uh, potassium. Oh, did I say calcium? No. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay, potassium. Mm -hmm. okay. Potassium. Potassium, yeah. And then for the fluids, you give isotonic saline. You give... Uh, your goal is to replace uh, four to six liters in the first uh, 12 hours. That's, like, uh, really, like, helpful to say if you just want to get out of trouble, you know? Mm -hmm. Or... You, 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 like if you like if you don't want to talk too much but then uh, uh like uh, like in the bulletin it goes over uh like exactly uh, like how you do it and uh things like that but yeah okay yeah what my um what uh my friend yao told me on friday is pretty much for any of the things if it's an ob trauma if it's dka if it's graves um if it's postpartum hemorrhage 
um, the, tr the magic number for trauma, like, um, based on like prior trauma studies is 50 mLs per kilogram is where you want to start. So he said, if you just say that number for any of them, you'll be in a ballpark range. 50 mL per kilogram of what? Of, uh, of, of fluids. So when you're, when you're replacing crystal, it doesn't matter if like, it's like an OB trauma scenario uh, or if it's like, uh, like okay. a, a, a postpartum hemorrhage scenario or like a DKA scenario, you can start with like 50 mLs per kilogram. Fifty um, kilogram. or like like you said, three to four liters. Um, yeah, it's a good starting point for fluids, just to make sure that you're getting enough. Because like for sepsis, like the number one thing is fluids and antibiotics immediately. Mm -hmm. So same thing with DK, it's it's fluids and insulin immediately. Cool. Cool. All right, All right. I'm ready for you guys. Let's uh, do it. Let's see. Um, so this patient comes in. She was recently tested for uh, BRCA, BRCA1, and she is positive. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. can you, how, how would you counsel this patient? So I would counsel this patient that uh, BRCA mutations are 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 autosomal dominant mutations that uh, run in families uh, and uh, I would refer her to a genetic uh, counselor uh, uh, like after I explained to her uh, her increased uh, chances of having uh, breast as well as uh, as as ovarian carcinoma okay so what are some of the chance how, how what's her chances of getting those two type of cancer so for BRCA1, the chances of getting uh, a breast cancer is uh, is uh, is very close to sixty percent, and for uh, and for uh, and for cancer of the ovary, it's around uh, forty to forty five percent. Okay. And uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, and, uh, and uh, before I send this patient to see uh, uh, a genetic uh, counselor, I would. Uh, I would start her on uh, combined birth control pills uh, as a chemo prophylaxis uh, to cancer of the ovary, and uh, I would uh, uh, counsel her about uh, uh, risk-reducing surgery if she has uh, if she has completed her family or if she's uh, more than the age of forty-five or uh, more than the age of forty. I'm sorry. What if this patient asks you? Oh, doesn't. Uh birth control increased my risk of getting breast cancer? Uh, that is true in cases of uh, hormone receptor uh, uh, positive uh, breast cancer. Uh, however, based on uh, based on evidence and uh, uh, multiple uh, 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 multiple uh, 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 trials, I uh, 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 combined birth control pills have been shown to uh, uh, to decrease the risk of of ovarian cancer in uh, BRCA1 carriers, and it and and it is indicated to start uh, 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 these patients on uh, on that for uh, for a chemo prophylaxis. Is there any other medication you can start her on, or consider start her on? Uh. I would have to look it up, but I think you can use tamoxifen for BRCA2 care. Mm -hmm. What's the type of breast cancer, ovarian cancer that you get with one versus two? So uh, with two, there's more incidence uh, of male uh, breast cancer and, uh, uh, and uh, triple negative uh, breast cancers as well. But for uh, BRCA1, uh, I'm not sure with BRCA2 what type of uh, cancer of the ovary you get, but that's for the breast cancer. But for BRCA1, sorry? Opposite. Type Bra BRCA1 is triple negative. BRCA2 is hormone positive. Oh, BRCA2 is hormone positive. Got it. Okay. So uh, one is the one who's hormone. Oh, okay. So uh, so that makes sense why we start these patients on uh, combined birth control, I guess. Yeah. So BRCA1 carries. Okay. Cool. I thought OCP, you can start... Um on both there's no increased risk for breast cancer 
but they get uh, the hormone positive breast cancer. That's why you should be more careful, I guess. Uh, BRCA2? Uh huh. That's what Hannah just said. Yeah. Um, I think you can I start OCP. Actually. One, but BRCA1 is more likely to be triple negative, and BRCA2 is more likely to be hormone positive or male breast cancer. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't know about distinguishing them for the OCPs. I, know I for think tamoxifen, yes, but tamoxifen is only used in BRCA2 because BRCA1 is less likely to be hormone positive. Right, right. But I don't know about distinguishing them for the OCP chemo prophylaxis. Yeah, I think you can do it in either. Yeah. And then um, what? Um, and then for both the ovarian cancer type is is high grade serous or endometrioid. Perfect. Um, so for the risk reducing uh, BOS, how would you do the surgery? So I don't perform the surgery in my practice. I would uh, refer them to uh, a guy in oncologist, but I believe the premise or the theory of the surgery is you need to to like to like not only uh, perform a bilateral uh, salpingo oophorectomy, but to uh, uh, but uh, to uh, dissect uh, uh, proximal to the uh, to uh, the origin of uh, the ovarian vessels. Uh, uh, to about two, two to three, uh, two, two to three centimeters, uh, to make sure there's no ovarian remnant syndrome after the surgery. Anything else? Uh, for BRCA one, uh, it is done by the age of thirty-five to forty, or uh, when the patient has completed her family and for BRCA2 it's done around the age of 40 to 45 or when the patient has completed the family. I think it's the opposite. I think it's 40, 45 for BRCA1 and 35 to 40 for BRCA2. No, the other way. The other way? Young, so, young, uh, young, the, the BRCA1 is younger and BRCA2 younger? is okay. late, uh, older. So 40 older. to 45. <laughs> Is always worse than BRCA2. That's how I remember it. Yeah, one is worse. Like one the triple worse. cancer, higher risk of ovarian cancer. And then when is it reasonable to offer a hysterectomy for someone with BRCA? Uh, I wouldn't offer a hysterectomy for someone with BRCA unless they have another uh, genetic mutation such as uh, Lynch syndrome or something similar. But I, But I don't routinely offer that to BRCA carriers. Okay, just so you know, I don't think they would ever ask you this, but just so you know, you can offer it to both. Oh, okay. Because BRCA1 increases your chance of type 2 uterine cancer, and BRCA2 is on tamoxifen, so you can offer them a hysterectomy because that way uh, it decreases their chance. It's a low chance, but it decreases their chance of abnormal bleeding and leiomyosarcoma in the future. Um, and you can do hormone replacement with estrogen patches if they don't have breast cancer. Okay. And, uh, just so you know, the, for the surgery, you're supposed to do a, um, uh, a, a pelvic wash, pelvic washing. And then for the, oh, with the okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then for the pathology, you're supposed to tell the pathology that it's for risk reducing, uh, BSO and they're supposed to um, have more sections uh, to look at on the ovaries to make sure there's no mm -hmm. um, overt uh, cancer. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. Hannah? Okay. Um, let's say, um, let's say you did a, uh, when would you do you do cold knife cones in your in your practice? Very rarely. Okay. What what are some of the situations you would choose to do a cold knife cone? So, um I would do a cold knife cone if they uh presented with CIN3. Um especially if it's in uh, on my ECC because I can take a uh deeper um evaluation of the uh, endocervical canal than I can on a leap. 
Um, or um, if I did a leap and it had positive margins and I'm following them and they are continuing to have abnormal paps, I would consider to do a cold knife cone at that point because I didn't get all the tissue on my leap. So I would want to repeat, um, repeat the surgery and I would probably repeat with a cold knife cone to make sure that I get deeper. Let's say uh, after your um, leap procedure, one of the specimens comes up marginal positive. How would you follow this patient? So I would talk to her about the alternatives of um, either uh, close following it at six months, where I would repeat the uh, pap um, uh, with HPV and colposcopy, versus um, repeating surgery and, um, and taking a second sample. Is that different if they're uh, negative? The margin is negative? Well, I wouldn't offer her the ability to go back for another surgery. So you would you would just do the the pap? Yeah, I would I would surveil her in six months versus if it had a positive margin, uh, it's acceptable to go back and do an immediate repeat surgery. So I would give her the options depending on what she was more comfortable with. Okay. Uh, what if the patient, let's say this patient comes in, she's HIV positive, uh, she's uh, 21 years old, never had a PAP before, how would you screen her for, um, how would you do her PAPs? So I would have to look up the guidelines because I don't treat HIV very frequently and I know it's more frequent than normal so I'd want to make sure I'm doing it appropriately. Um, but I would pap her immediately um, with uh, cytology. And then I would um, basically look up the guidelines to see how frequently it needs to be done. I think it's like once every year for like the first three, and then it's like every three years after that for life. But I don't know right. completely off my head. Okay. Not bad for guessing. <laughs> yeah, that's correct. Yeah. All right. Uh, you want to? Ask something. Yeah, sure. So let's say, doctor, you have a patient, a 38-year-old patient who's, uh, who came to you for a PAP from their uh, primary care doctor with a reading that, sh that says AGUS. And uh, the primary care doctor doesn't know what that is and he doesn't want to deal with it. And he uh, sends her to you so you can, uh, so you can counsel her. Uh, how would you manage her? How would you counsel her? Um, so for AGUS, um, it's something that is, um, uh, it, it can be, um, associated with, uh, either an endometrial or a, um, cervical abnormality. Um, so I would counsel her that, um, uh, she would need to have both a colposcopy done and an endometrial biopsy. Um, it's less common that it's an endometrial abnormality in someone who's under 35. Um, but in my practice, to make sure I'm not missing anything, at the time of colposcopy, I would do um, cervical biopsies with an ECC. Um, unless the patient's pregnant, I would skip the ECC. And um, if she's not pregnant, I would also do an endometrial sampling to make sure I'm not missing an endometrial abnormality. Perfect. Very good. And uh, let's say all these uh, results came back negative. How would you follow her up? Would you uh, like go back to like routine screening or what would you do next? Um, I am assuming I would repeat it at least one year later, but I'd have to look it up because I don't see it very often in my office. Okay. All right. And uh, yeah, I think, I think that's all I needed to ask. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So you... You repeat uh, one one year and then a year two, um, and then if if it comes back consistently agus, but when you do the the diagnostic stuff and it's negative, you're supposed to screen for other um, like malignancies like ovarian and tubal, like with a C125 and also with um, an ultrasound. What? Yeah. I would, have never, 
I would have guessed if it was recurrent that you would do a hysteroscopy DNC, but that's good to know. So you need to work up for other cancers. Yeah, because yeah. uh, it can be from other origins and not just endometrial and cervical. It can be from like a malignancy from the ovaries or the tubes. Um, okay. It's on, it's on up to date because I, I just literally just read Man. it. And you and your up to date, dude. Yeah, yeah, mm, but I mm, but I don't think there's any like approved uh, like screening for like cancer of the ovary. Like, you know, you just go by symptoms basically, and oh, and, she, like, she is uh, having symptoms. The ag she's agus positive. So right. you would yeah. do ultrasound. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. So ultrasound to look for uh, at nexo masses and CA one twenty five. So, would you do a diagnostic? No, I'm not sure about that. Like my I can send you the up to date. Um, that's what it said. Okay, my knee jerk reaction would be to do a diagnostic hysteroscopy because I'd be concerned that there's an occult in the mitral lesion that I'm missing on on biopsy. Uh, all right. Let me just pull it up real quick so that. Um, I don't know if that's part of it or not. I'd have to look it up and see uh, this. That you never actually. You know, um, but just my knee jerk reaction would be, you know, because endometrial sampling is great if it's positive, but if it's negative, it's like not super. All right. It's so, okay. So here's what it says patient with persistent mm -hmm. cyto cytological finding associated with high risk malignancy, such as persistent AGC, not otherwise specified or AGC endocervical, AGC endometrial, AGC flavored uh, neoplasm, AIS or adenocarcinoma. Um, and so for these patients uh, who have negative cervical and endometrial findings despite comprehensive evaluation, um, such as uh, colposcopy, endometrial biopsy, or colonization, these patients should be evaluated for primary or metastatic disease involving the ovary and fallopian tube. Oh, okay. Um, which will be right. the, the first, line, do, uh... first line study is transvaginal ultrasound and CA125. Okay, yeah, that's good to know because my ref my knee mm. reaction to hysteroscopy because I would be thinking, what about that fifteen percent that's missed on EMB? Yeah, what right. well, what I read on the pearl about uh, these like AGC cytologies is that they are associated with uh, they can be like associated with like polyps, metaplasia, cancers of the endometrium, uh, fallopian tubes, and ovaries, mm -hmm. and rarely with uh, with. With like intra like abdominal cancer, um, right? It, uh, um, especially in 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 like in in like older patients with with like with like negative HPV. Uh, but but like yeah, but like I'm not sure what the role is of uh, uh, doing uh, like an ultrasound and a CA like one twenty five, especially if if it's like done periodically for screening i don't think that's something that uh, like is a thing it, it's not it's not screening though it's because she has it's oh so like you're oh so like, like you're working her up for ovarian right. cancer maybe. yeah okay yeah sure yeah that uh, makes sense well it also says there's no standard workout for patients with persistent agc that is unexplained so it's i mean i guess it's you know this is like you can consider doing these things, but there's no right, right. workup. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. Yeah. Just FYI. When yes. is your test? Sounds good. My test is Monday, eight thirty. <laughs> right. So are you are you in Dallas right now then? No, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave uh Saturday. Wait, it's oh, not. Oh, no, not. No, it's, it's not, not this Monday, right? No, no, yeah, no, yeah, it's, it's not in it's a couple the ninth, of days. The ninth. Yeah. It's in one week. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's beginning of October, which is this week. That's why I was wondering. Yeah. So, do you want to find the next weekend? Yeah, sure. I'll be in Dallas, but I can still pop on. What time do you get there? I'm gonna be there on Saturday, so Sunday I'm okay. just sitting around. <laughs> do you want to do Sunday? Yeah, we, yeah, can, we can try and do one o'clock again. That's yeah. Maybe it'll make us nervous to practice. Yeah, I think so. 
Yeah, we can do okay. that. Okay. Let's plan for that, then we can just do more case studies. Sounds good. Yeah, sounds good. Studying. Right. I'll see you guys next. Yeah. All right. All, All right. right. Thanks, guys. Have a good day. Bye. See you again. See you later. Bye.